Hello. Hello. Um, anyone recognize this guy? Uh, yes, exactly. BCPO. Um, we'll give some more detail on him. Uh, this is the Bureau for the Containment of Programmatic Life Forms, which is a multifaceted thing that we'll cover. Who am I? Um, I work, I'm, I lived here in London at one point, I'm here back on holiday at the moment, I'm working uh, over in California at Google's Nest Labs. I don't think they're so well known over here, uh, but they do sort of home automation, smart home. The particular thing I work on is the, the cameras, I do like the embedded audio for their cameras. Um, I've worked in tech for over 20 years, but I've actually always, growing up I was much more into drawing comic books, doing music, so I've always kind of oscillated between uh, sort of tech influences and the sort of more sort of creative aspects. Uh, so this, this is an unlikely tale of me trying to merge all of them together, so sort of music, comics, uh, and, and a tech company. It's an imaginary startup, which would be good if it wasn't imaginary, but so far um, it's multiple things. Um, yeah, so I moved out to California six years ago. Um, I'd been in London, I'd been working at Last FM, I'd been running a record label, and I got a job going over there to a music distributor. They were called Independent Online Distribution Alliance. Uh, they, were, they were dealing with a lot of independent labels and giving them good deals to go to the iTunes store originally, but then all the other online stores. The idea being that you know, you've got the four majors at that time, Universal, Warner, EMI, Sony, IOTA, with the kind of combined uh, strength of all these guys, had just as much bargaining power and could get good deals for them. I was doing sort of DevOps, lots of Docker, lots of AWS, lots of orchestration. Um, it was good. Um, would go out to a lot of meetups when I got there, so there's lots of uh, there's lots of like Docker meetups, there's Kubernetes meetups, sort of DevOps ones in general, but I actually found a lot of the programming ones to be much more fun. Uh, there was a Scala meetups in particular, uh, really good sort of more theoretical aspect of programming, Go in general as well. And I started just buying more and more, researching more and more sort of programming language history, something I'd always been interested in, but so I got more and more into it as well. And coming from the sort of sysadmin DevOps background, it started out more as a sort of design of operating systems, Unix operating system. There's a lot of these like Kernigan and Ritchie books, like Brian Kernigan turns up in a number of places here with Rob Pike from the, the practice of programming, Unix programming environment, um, the classic C programming language book, the KNR. Uh, Lions commentary is really good. So the Go programming language in particular had a lot of appeal because out at these meetups you'd sort of see Rob Pike and Brian, uh, Brad Fitzpatrick, all very good talkers and just coming from that uh, Unix background, uh, um, in fact Ken Thompson as well, one of the originators of sort of Unix operating system, also working at Google on the uh, Go programming language. And almost everything these days in the sort of DevOps world is written in Go from whether it's Docker, Kubernetes, a lot of the sort of core OS type utilities. So start buying more and more of these books. I have actually read most of these, but some of them get sort of dense and you can kind of fall away halfway through or so. But my, my bookshelf is like more and more, I've got hundreds. This is just one from my Instagram of collections of sort of more Unixy ones. Uh, here's a couple of others. This is actually, one of my favorites, this is the oldest computer book I've managed to find. This is from 1949, Giant Brains or Machines That Think, and it was all about the, how society would change and what, what computers actually were. I don't even think computer as a terminology had come in at that point as well, or maybe it had, I'm sort of guessing there. This one was just really interesting, coded character sets. This one, uh, this guy, Nicholas Worth, he had, he, um, it Pascal, I think he'd come up with. I thought this was actually one of the most stylish books um, it looks like an Italian sports car from the 60s. That's just another nice one from the Tony Hoare sort of series here. This was my attempt at humour. This was my Algo Lolcats. Didn't get very much like, so it's just like my cat didn't look very interested either. This is Boone. This book, though, this was my birthday a couple of years ago. Sitting with my Manhattan, I'd got like, a BCPL book. And BCPL was like, um, let's actually get to that one, I think that's the next slide here. So Martin Richards, as this gentleman over here recognised, um, Cambridge in the 60s. Before that you had Algol, it was a sort of dominant language which influenced many others after that. Cambridge at that time had a Cambridge programming language. 
and then Cambridge kind of got together with University of London and then he changed it to combined programming language. Um, still a very complex language at that point, so Martin Richards, he kind of stripped out a lot of the things which weren't necessary and had this basic combined programming language. Originally meant as a language for writing compilers, but it has a number of interesting features which we recognise from all the sort of C derivatives. Um, first programming language to use braces for its organisation. The original Hello World program was also written in BCPL as well. Um, it was untyped, it could only ever, it was meant for writing compilers, so it was actually, it emulated the computer itself, so like, like a register, a register is a, for, I don't know what the sort of level here, registers a small amount of memory for sort of manipulating from the CPU itself. Um, it just has a memory size, it doesn't have any sort of specific type, it's not an integer, it's not a float, it's not a character. And so BCPL sort of mirrored that, everything was just like a computer word and it was interpreted based on uh, whichever operator using a you were adding two addresses together. If it was a plus sign it would interpret them as an integer. Um, another, this, but we all know this, a single line comment, like two slashes where it's like a rest of line comment kind of came from here as well. Um, Getting back to the sort of Unix thing as well though, so Unix original version, sort of 1969-1970, was written in assembly language, um, but Ken Thompson, the main architect was Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, but Ken Thompson decided that uh, Unix needed a systems programming language, and he wrote something called B, which was a kind of more stripped down version of BCPL, and so then when Dennis Ritchie went on to write his next language, it became C. Uh, there was also talk about what would come after C, whether it be D or whether it be P, if you're sort of following the acronym, and it became C++, but that's a different thing as well. Um, so this is all just some background on what BCP, this is one form of BCPL, there's a number of different BCPLs which I have here, but it all basically comes back to this, it's a somewhat annoying in-joke to the programming language itself. Um, let's see. So, um, I tended to oscillate back and forth between you know, the programming practices, creative sides, making music, running record labels and doing a lot of illustration comics. So I started getting into these, this was my series of cardboard computer scientists. These are actually 12 inch, each one each is probably about 12 inch because uh, the round ones are actually the backing from like a frozen pizza. You, know, you just keep the cardboard from that. The, the square ones actually tended to be from ordering 12 inch records and it was like the inserts, so I keep them strong. Doug Engelbart, um, I actually, previous life, I was back out in California, late 90s, I, I was working at Stanford Research Institute, Doug Engelbart, um, he gave the mother of all demos, and I'm back, I don't know which year it was, it was I think it was the 60s, but he gave um, a talk where he actually introduced, he had invented the mouse, which was originally an XY pointing device, but he had windowing systems, he had come up with hypertext, he was doing video conferencing, and he actually did this from Menlo Park to San Francisco, I think it was 1969, and you can actually find this, the mother of all demos, it's on YouTube and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, at Stanford Research Institute I was working doing desktop technician at one point, and I actually had to go to his office and fix his computer. I don't remember what I was doing specifically, I'd like to think I had to fix his mouse, but that's probably <laughs> untrue. <laughs> Claude Shannon, the, the father of theory of um, information, sort of like um, communication theory, a uh, ton of good stuff. John McCarthy, like, not so much actually wrote Lisp himself, but his, he was basically the idea behind that, and one of his students actually um, then implemented Lisp. Um, sort of good stuff here. Uh, Vannevar Bush, he actually wrote a, a very influential paper. Um, that was, I should just check my, what was the... He had a paper which was written, it was published in the Atlantic 1945, as we may think, and he had this, he was talking about how society could be, he was imagining where computers would go and what they could do for society. He came up with the idea of the memex, like the memory e extension I think it was, or external, but it was more the idea of like index data, that you know, this predated so much stuff, but he influenced uh, so many people who then went on to work on the ARPANET and like the idea of like sort of how you can join together technologies. Ted Nelson, this guy is my favourite, the only word for this guy is curmudgeon um, and like Ted Nelson is, he actually wrote a thing called Xanadu, or he had the idea for Xanadu which was the first idea of hyperlinked information, um, he wasn't the only one, like before Tim Berners-Lee's World Wide Web there was lots of people playing with the idea of hyperlinked text and it was just which one would sort of catch on. 
Ted Nelson's Xanadu was a different, it, it sort of two-way links and much more, it was more the idea for it, but he's, he, he's definitely got a chip in his shoulder. Um, he has a series, he actually did, this was an amazingly influential zine that he did. Uh, one of them is how pissed off he is, and one of them is like his optimism for the future of what science could be. But this again as well, this is, I think this was 1974 that he came out with this. Crazy zine. But he also has, he now works at the Internet Archive in San Francisco. Um, and he has a series of talks which he has put online called Computers for Cynics. And I think he basically, after everyone has gone home at night, he just turns his camera on himself and he sits there and he bitches into that camera. <laughs> and you can subscribe to them on YouTube and they're so good because he just, he trashes everyone. He's like, that guy didn't know what he's talking about. That guy is just really good. That's from Twin Peaks, isn't it? Isn't, it? From, <laughs> isn't there a, is a similarity in Twin Peaks? Is it? Anyway, if you've not but, seen it, then... Yes, yes, yeah. the okay. 3D, yes. Sorry. <laughs> the 3D glasses, then, yes. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, totally. This is another book he did. Um, you can also get this on Amazon. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, that, that's all. Uh, they're all just distractions from back to these guys. Ken Thompson, The Dawn, and Dennis Ritchie. Here they are in their natural environment, <laughs> inventing Unix. Um, what do I have next? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, around this time, all these talk meetups, I was doing a lot of my creative projects. I'd all these drawings I was doing. I was also doing a number of different uh, programming uh, projects as well. I had some friends who were doing some Raspberry Pi and Arduino stuff. We had some little self-driving car which would use light sensors to avoid the walls. I don't have any video footage of that. Um, we had like a, there's a robot bartender competition in San Francisco. We didn't take part in that. We were actually trying to do something which could recognize. We, had a, a, we built a spectroscope and we were going to try and analyze the contents of the liquid. It got so far but it was uh, but it's, it's all right. Um, another thing which I do have a demo of is trying, this is almost like the most literal interpretation. I'm trying to use my illustrations for programming. I, we went to, a, there's a computer game uh, symposium thing and it, it occurred to me I'd never actually tried to do like a video game and of course you can use kind of art for that. So let's see if we can do skateboard cat killer. I thought, if I'm going to do a video game, what, what would I do about it? What do I like? I like skateboarding and I like cats. Um, so I kind of combine them into a game. I'm not sh the, the latency here is a bit strange. So I don't know how easy it will be to play this if it will come up on screen. But let's try it. Uh, so there should be music here. And you basically try and survive for a minute without killing cats. It actually does. If I can keep going for a minute, I'm not going to actually, I don't think. Uh, the, the music changes the answer, but... Thirty-one seconds, can it? No, no I'm running out. So. That was kind of fun. Um, let me see. There are other, I was doing sort of science fiction comics at the time as well. These, uh, this, this particular comic was uh, sort of set in a future. It's two or three years ago. The idea of this one was kind of influenced by sort of, there's a Scandinavian country which was importing trash from everywhere else. I don't know which one it was, but they were basically so good at recycling trash you could actually make money from it and sort of pull it in from other places. So this is going to set in a future America where um, self-driving trucks, they would pick up the trash and move it all to California. And it, it sort of predates like the, the whole automation loss of jobs because the idea was you could apply and you could be a, a, the guard that would be on these trucks. They're actually driven by like an AI and the actual, the AI itself has a physical form. It's got a kind of robot thing. So the guy's kind of useless, but there's like the Asimov laws and supposedly he's a kind of security guard that kind of comes along and monitors it, but he's superfluous there. Um, so this is a truck crossing country, one of the guys, and yeah. Um, so this is the AI chat for it as well. Um, it, doing a comic is a lot of work. It takes a lot of dedication, the timing of it for the writing, the drawing, the inking, and it really does take a lot of your time. And with so many other programming projects, it didn't actually go too far. But the idea for that comes, it builds upon a lot of technologies and world building that I did a couple years ago in London. This is my first sort of science fiction comic. And at physical surgery as well, BCPL is one of those obscure references that you kind of are kind of fun. 
Physiker's surgery is a reference to Le Corbusier's, uh, the sit it's a, his book he did, he was an architect, um, book from 1929, The City of Tomorrow and Its Planning, where he was, this is even before, you know, 1929, so he didn't even have, I don't think the first skyscraper was up in Chicago by this point as well. He had this idea for how you would plan out cities in advance and you would have massive structures but you'd also have plenty of garden around them and it was all very planned out how social, um, social activities and economics would work from that. And physical surgery was a chapter, was chap the title of chapter 11 from this book and back then like, it's not, physic here refers to medicine so it's the idea like can we give it medicine or do we have to um, do surgery, can we save the existing cities, do we have to you know, can we save them or do we have to like, knock them down and start again? So it's just another obscure reference which I found kind of fun as well. But um, in this one, it's the idea of, um, kind of uh, I guess the inspiration for this was reading a lot about Detroit at that time. And you know, everyone had left Detroit supposedly, but you get the artists moving in and you have other alternative cultures coming up around it. So this was set in the UK. This is supposed to be Bradford in the year 2036. And I just looked for one of the most industrialised cities in the UK, which, and it's kind of close to Leeds, so it's almost like if you're going to, if your resources are more scarce, everyone would move to Leeds and you'd have these abandoned cities. So the idea is that you'd have groups of engineers and hackers would like move in, take over these cities, oh, if you don't want them, we will manage them. So it's the idea of government as an engineering practice, you could you know, go in and sort of start over. And a lot of the technologies in here, these, these little kind of flying globes were supposed to be powered by M drive, which is another theoretical thing at the moment. It uses magnetic resonance and it kind of disobeys the laws of conservation where using this sort of magnetic resonance you get like a, a thrust from no actual fuel to it as well. But these, this guy's a skateboarder making his living working for the Tony Hawk network. He's live streaming his day kind of thing and uh, so there's like little video cameras here but they're also, it's kind of like your mobile phone in the future. Like everyone has these globes around and it's it's also like a holographic projector with a tactile interface, like haptic feedback, so you can show your friends things, you can share things, you can communicate and it gives you instructions and it's your, your little personal AI. Uh, so that, that was a couple of years ago, but it still forms the basis. Oh, there's that. Um, right, so this, this is all, as I was saying, I was more sort of DevOps. I was working for, I started working for Nest about three years ago. At the time it was Dropcam, I just started at Dropcam and they got acquired by Nest. Nest had just been acquired by Google like a couple months earlier. Originally I was doing all the network infrastructure for them, it was all uh, in introduced like the first kind of dockerized service for those guys and a lot of automation, sort of chat ops idea as well, you can sort of control a lot of things just from like your sort of hip chat channel and a lot of metrics and feedback and actually a lot of visualization into what the systems were actually doing at that point. So it actually involved like a lot more coding and stuff, it was, it was really good. Um, but no matter how much you automate systems, when you start managing thousands of servers, there's still something that will break and will page you at like four in the morning. Um, DevOps is hard life. It's kind of fun, but it's also, it wears on you. And after a while, I sort of wanted to move over to more to the programming side and with all these kind of uh, projects I've been working on. Uh, first of all, it was this one, and this is the, the project I actually started on when I was programming. Uh, this ties in, you were talking about the Erlang actor model. This is, this is all written, uh, f this was a rewrite for this camera. It was all like um, C++ using all the sort of modern features, C++ 11 and 14. And it used the, you don't actually get like first class like actors for C++, but it's actually quite easy to write yourself. The active object model pushed by Herb Sutter in a Dr. Dobbs article from 2010 shows you how to. And basically your major high level components have you give them a, a member object thread and on their constructor uh, your thread you set up and it just says like an event loop. So when you're communicating, the way that you can actually communicate with these guys without sharing state or anything, uh, you, you work with futures and promises. So any call between high level components, um, you, you call the component, uh, you get a promise, you give them back a future. Uh, which is just basically a, a promise to do work later kind of thing, so you can continue, you don't have to have blocking calls, and you just basically stick onto your event queue, you do your work, and that sort of separates all your data and your sort of methods, and it's, it's one way of, sort of scaling something up without having to worry about, because concurrency is super hard, it's the thing that can go wrong so often, and the hard thing about concurrency and threading and sharing data, 
you may not know you've got a bug and it'll run in production for so long and then, then you'll get that call at four in the morning and it's going to be so hard to like replicate and sort of do so. Um, moving into this team, it's also hardcore coders and uh, this is C++, the previous one's platform is in C. I'd never done any C at this point. C is that big sort of scary thing where it's like, oh, you can kill your machine, you have to worry about memory allocation and so. So as I started in this team, the, the project, um, I, I had to, I had already been doing I'd started working with sort of chatbot stuff as well, and it was a command REPL. And I was trying to, uh, I'd started trying to dabble with AI. I was like, someone's got to solve this. It must be really simple. Like, obviously, it's not simple because no one's done it. Um, artificial intelligence, as we know it today, is just more machine learning. It's just pattern recognition and repeating things which you can glean from, glean from other um, areas. The, the actual idea of synthetic consciousness was the idea that now you could. I know, that you can actually converse with something that has feelings and emotions. That's a much harder thing, but the fact that we all do it, that creatures do it, it just seems like there must be a simple algorithm there somewhere. But, so I, I had a rep, I was trying to do things like you could chat with it, and I was trying to separate subject and predicate, and the simplest model I could think of was just like things and connections between them and trying to do things. It, so you can build up more and more models of how you can interpret things, but it's still very hard, there's still the idea of any experiential, how you would experience that is still, it's a philosophical question, it's not a technical one, it's just how would you do that? So eventually my REPL project, I kind of, no idea what's, I don't know what to do next here. And I started playing more with music at this point, I was doing, it's just a command line REPL and you could sort of combine like sine waves and other 16 step sequencers. And I had been doing that in Go at the time because I had been doing um, Go programming from going out and around. Um, so I shall try and show this it's going to be harder to show. This is a command line music program, which is, it's kind of like a command line version of Ableton Live. It's the closest I can come to it. There's a number of different instruments which it has. There's a 16 step sequencer for, you can use samples or you can use like a synth drum, a couple of oscillators. You can make your own set of drums and snares and hi-hats. It has a, an actual synthesizer as well. It's however many voices you want, but each voice is three oscillators, um, you have an LFO that m modulates this and it b basically gives you your keys. There's, there's envelope generators and, well, let me show you one of them. Uh, so I've created a mini synthesizer. This is very much based after Unix. Let me see if I can even make this bigger. So if you type PS, you can see what's running. You can see your mixing desk, you can see the key you're in, BPM, your ticks. And I, I have a synth here. Um, there's a lot more to see about it. So this is the, the synthesizer interface. You can see en your envelope stuff, your LFO. Here's your set of voices. Too much to kind of go through. It's really hard to show this when I've ever tried it kind of thing. But you can control it from your keyboard here. Um, let me see if sound comes out. There might be a bit of a delay. All right. Um, you can randomize it so you can actually have different. Let's see. So you get the idea. You can sort of randomize things, but you can also um, I got it so you can sort of save settings. You can see sort of different names here. One of them at the bottom here is called Stereo Lab because it sounds a bit like uh, what well, was Space Age Bachelor Pad. Um, so let's see. You can actually I started playing more and more with algorithms. It's kind of fun to. I want it basically to generate its own sort of music form, so I can do a sign, um, actually I have some, I wrote these in so I could, I'm going to load up the stereo lab one and I'm going to tell it to generate a melody and see if it, see if it comes up with an interesting one. Uh, sometimes it only comes up with like one thing. Yeah. It's still a delay here. Let's see. All right. I started reading up on sort of music theory and what sort of notes could follow each other and stuff. So it's literally just interpreting. Um, but you, you get the idea. It can do things. Um, it can generate its own melodies. The step sequencers can have a really interesting thing I'd found was something called Euclidean rhythms, which is, I've got a text here I, wrote, I didn't write, I found it. Um, the basic concept of Euclidean rhythms is that distributing, let's turn that down. Um, 
You can distribute an arbitrary number of beats evenly over a larger number of pulses, like the 16 steps, and many of these rhythms are found in music around the world. At basic level, distributing four kicks over 16 pulses and two claps over the same 16 pulses results in one of the most common dance music patterns. But research shows more complex relationships like three beats over eight pulses gives you the Cuban Tricillo pattern, five over 16 gives you the bossa nova, and seven over 12 gives you a common West African bell pattern. Um, so let me see if we can put in some Euclidean algorithms here as well. Oh. Actually, that might get a bit much as well. I'll try this and see if it, what happens. Let's see. So this is a step sequencer and it doesn't, I haven't loaded any sort of step things to it. You can change a number of things to the volume and there's different algorithms beyond the Euclidean one, but I shall, I shall do sequence one. Uh, yeah, you need to learn all these kind of abstract things, but it's basically the Euclidean pattern. You tell it how many loops you want it to do, so I'll do every sort of second one. The delay makes it a bit more. Did I turn that up? So, you get the idea. There's other things. Um, there's some sample looper stuff that generates and changes over time as well, but I'll leave it at that. Um, it's all actually up on GitHub as well. If anyone wants to play with this, it's there. But this is how I learned C, and I've been working on this for two years, and it, it does work, actually. I feel like my C skills are got a lot better during this, and it's, it's helped for work. Uh, all right, so one last sort of piece in between. So the, the comic ideas and stuff, I came up with this idea for BCPL as a comic, the Bureau for the Containment of Programmatic Lifeforms. You can read some of this yourself. It's just basically the, the idea that at some point synthetic consciousness, when an idea comes of time, it sort of happens all over the world at the same time, whether it's electricity or radio, you have multiple people. So it's the idea that at some point synthetic consciousness will bloom and governments have to react to it and like track down and they basically want to register this. You don't want these unregistered AIs around. But it's, it's basically like the X-Files for AI. You've got a team of you know, people like looking for signs of unregistered AIs and sort of tracking them down. And this, I've actually started the ideas for this, but I've never, as I mentioned before, like it's really, uh, a comic takes so much dedication and time to do for it, and like, I've been spending more of my time doing the music program, so this is just an idea in the back of my head. It's been kicking around, I've had various ideas of who the characters would be or how they would um, implement this. Uh, the music project I've been doing, I actually started using the name BCPL as well, so so you have the, the programming language, you have the comic, it's now my artist name as well. And what we have, right, so yeah, this all, this is all great. Got these different ideas. Um, working at Nest, like Google's a great company to work for, but you know, you've got to commute every day and you've got to do work for other people. You have to like say, do what they tell you. There's just to be a lovely pipe room. If you just somehow work on your own. I, I've never had any inclination to do like a startup by myself. The idea of like going out looking for capital and investment sounds like such a, hus a hustle that I'm just terrible at kind of, I much prefer just working creative things. Um, I live out in the Sunset neighborhood in San Francisco, which this makes it look super nice. This is like the ocean out there. And this is my walk home from work, um, coming down to the neighborhood. It's, this makes it look super nice and it, it is. You get nice little colorful houses like this and you get surfers and joggers down the beach. But it's actually not very highly thought of in San Francisco um, because quite often what happens, you're downtown, it's a beautiful summer day. And you're like, oh, that's right, there's a beach here. So you jump on the train, you cross over Twin Peaks, which is a big sort of hill in the center of town. And as soon as you get over there, this is what you see. You're like, where the hell did the sunshine go? And it's just, yeah, it's foggy as hell kind of thing. But it's great. Um, so in my daydream, I would love to spend more time here as opposed to traveling down. And there was just a daydream where it was, um, it'd be great just if Google would pay for me to work on comics and work on my music program and like <laughs> live in my neighborhood. Like, oh, I'd, of course I was kind of <laughs> smoking away like, oh, well, that'd be great, wouldn't it? So, but then a couple of months ago, actually, I discovered Google actually have their own startup accelerator, kind of like a Y Combinator, it's called Area 120. Um, and it's like, oh, that's 
exactly what I was thinking of. And it's, it's so outrageous an idea, of course I'm not going to go for it, but you have to try it. It's like, why? At, in the back of my head, I was thinking, they're going to get all these hundreds of applications, the Uber for X, they're going to have other Uber for Y, machine learning for this. If you suddenly get like a, a pitch for the BCPL, <laughs> The world's first capitalist, absurdist, quasi-fictional organization dedicated to blurring the walls of narrative and reality. Who wouldn't go for that? So, uh, so I basically put together a, a, a slideshow for them using some of these different um, synthetic consciousnesses coming. This is from the Physical Surgery comic. That's not actually a synthetic consciousness. It's more of a sort of haptic feedback, like it's some guy's memory from the year before he's kind of grepped his history for. Um, and basically trying to push this idea that you need more than just like, in the comics I've been thinking it was going to be some girl at art school in Glasgow who comes up with the first synthetic consciousness, someone who's like not just trying to make computers do things, she's trying to get her computer high, she's like how do I make this computer like make weird things? So yeah, artists, philosophers, hackers, writers, magicians, um, uh, another scene from that comic, we create astonishing worlds and inhabit them, grow with them, and I kind of like this turn of phrase, we we retrieve things from beyond the event horizon of fiction. This is like the text, you're not meant to read that. It's just more of the, the background for these M drive powered um, pulsings. And we plan to create synthetic consciousness. Just the background for what I was going to be explaining there uh, about the kind of comic. It was basically this two pronged approach where you'd have a reality department and a fiction department, and the engineers and the artists would switch place every month, and people would just mix it up. and. And we would just somehow create consciousness and, <laughs> and we'd have a party. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the Bureau for the Containment of Programmatic Life Forms. Many, many people here, some of them of my age, not you youngsters, but some of the oldsters might like to know the BBC operating system of BBC Basic were written in BCPL. And so too was Amiga Oz. Right. So BCPL has had an effect on many of us. Right, right. Did you work with it yourself? No. Too young. Right. I, th I think I'd found something else about it as well, was there? But yeah, that's excellent. I didn't know that.